Okay, good evening everybody. I'm gonna do a trial and kind of a topic video today. And we're going to be seeing a lot more videos with screenshots, less of me on camera, although you know, once in a while I'll do something like that. And what we're talking about today is a topic that is, um, in the past it was a very serious subject. It still probably should be a serious subject, but because of politics, because of people's desire to make everything an issue of politics. It's become sort of a farce, it's become a issue that's that's uh, really what they used to call wedge issues back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, topics that you use in order to drive people against a certain group that you're against, and it's the Holocaust this time. Uh, yesterday in certain countries, I think Israel would be the one in mind, they commemorate the Holocaust Remembrance Day. It's a huge um, event in a lot of Jewish communities in the United States. Uh, obviously, it's a huge event over there. Even though the Holocaust ended in 1945, there are still people around that are survivors and they give testimonials and whatnot. It is a um, topic that we don't know how it's going to develop in the future because a lot of those people have been passing away and they're in their 80s and 90s now. Um, but I'm, I'm here to kind of give an alternative perspective about why I think this holiday's really uh, gone off the rails in some ways. Or not just the holiday, really the topic of the Holocaust and, and Nazism and uh, World War II and everything, we've come to a point where it's basically used as a tool to attack political enemies. Um, basically, if you're living in the U.S. or in most of the Western world, um, when you talk about um, calling somebody a Nazi, you're often um, painting people that simply have views that are right-wing. Even though the Nazi party, it only signifies their, their, their ideology really encompassed a philosophy that was not exactly right-wing as we call it in the United States. It had very little to do with capitalism. It had very little to do with, um, you know, a lot of the elements that are modern right-wing movements talk about, except in some cases racial um, racial intolerance. Uh, otherwise, it's it's been pretty much a, um, you know, just an epithet used to slander other people. Um, it's been used against police. It's been used against people that are uh, Christian fundamentalists, for example. That's not, you know, you can call them intolerant, but they're not exactly Nazis. Um, and how I came to talk about this today was, I didn't even know it was Holocaust Memorial Day today. Uh, day today. Um, I had a friend who commented, he was saying that uh, there's an obsession over there in Israel with, with uh, Hitler documentaries, talking about how bizarre of a person he is and how poor of a um, spectacle of a human being he is and, and all of the ways that he manipulated the German people into doing what they were doing and he was disputing that he was saying that the German people are traditionally ha they have had a history of anti-semitism way be beyond the Holocaust I don't think you can really dispute that anti-semitism did not begin or end in Germany or anywhere else with the Holocaust it did not start in 1933 and in fact the word anti-Semitism is one that I rarely use. I usually use the word anti-Jew or anti-Jewish anti, um, anti or, or, or some variant on that or Jew-hating. Um, the word anti-Semitism was actually used by intellectuals, I believe they were in Germany, that didn't like the term Jew hatred. They, they thought it was not uh, intellectual or deep thinking enough. So they came up with anti-Semitism with the rationale being that the traditional ancestor of the Jews in the Bible was Shem, the son of Noah. Um, and it's been used ironically in, in recent years 
when a lot of um, Arab and Muslim uh, activists against against the Jews, against Israel, say, you can't call us anti-Semitic, we're a Semitic people too. Well, that, that has nothing to do with the original intent of the term. Uh, a Semite, yes, a Semite, is, uh, that, that was uh, an erroneous use of the word by the Germans and or, or whoever came up with the term. And really, it has nothing to do with the, the fact that, yeah, there are Semitic peoples. They're traditionally considered to have come from uh, the, uh, you know, the, the Semites, the children of Shem. But so have, you know, d d various other peoples. It's, it has nothing to do with the fact that the, the intellectuals that came up with the term wanted to talk about Jews. Um, and, you know, you could, you, you'd probably have to come up with a different term to describe hatred of, of the rest of the Semites, you know, actual hatred of the Arabs. You could call it Arabophobia. I think I've I heard that term a long time ago. It's not really been in vogue because Islamophobia has been the real term that's been used to talk about that issue. Um, so what what is the problem that we're facing here as a people on Holocaust Memorial Day? We're talking about basically um, a creeping of the modern times into this topic, okay? Um, originally, most people thought that um, the Holocaust would never happen again and that humanity would never tolerate the murder of innocent people again. And it's turned out to be a complete crock. And that's kind of what I write about. The fact is that um, as I write, to me, it was a surreal experience to discover that today is Holocaust Memorial Day as it is observed in Israel. But it's completely slipped my attention. As a person that went to a Jewish middle school and lived in two different households that were Jewish, though vastly different in outlook, this holiday had once been a yearly pilgrimage to an auditorium. Um, so what we used to do, we used to go every year uh, in the school that I went to, which I'm not going to give them any press because I didn't like it, or I'm not, I'm not going to give them a plug. I don't know about press. Um, basically what happened was that they, they would take us to an event and we would hear the stories of survivors and, and often it was the same survivor. She was, a you know, a great lady probably in her, I think she's still alive. I think she's in her, her early eighties because she was, she was a kid at the time of the Holocaust. And um, we would go to these auditoriums and we would hear these testimonials. And there's nothing wrong with hearing a testimonial. I think that is the true spirit of at least knowing what happened at the time. And there's so many topics to cover within the Holocaust that it's not really, that's not really what I'm trying to do here. Um, <coughs> but I think that, the, that today and, and the Holocaust in general has been morphed into a topic that has become basically political capital for people that want to push certain agendas. Now, let me get to the root of some of the problems here. Um, first of all, there's a the focus on the Germans. Okay, yeah, you cannot go through the Holocaust without obviously talking about Hitler, about the German nation, about many of them that were willingly complicit in it, but, but, you have to acknowledge that, first of all, there, there were sectors of the German people that did oppose the Holocaust. Uh, they, were, they were not really consequential. They didn't prevent it. Obviously, they failed. Uh, the people that did try, they failed. It was, it was not exactly a fair fight because you're talking about a state terror apparatus, the, the German um, Gestapo versus a bunch of uh, random opponents, some, in some cases, civilian dissidents, in some cases, um, you know, the rare military uh, dissident, in some cases, you know, civilians that would hide people. And um, this was pretty much a pattern um, throughout the war that the German people as a whole did comply with the desire of the, of the government and of uh, basically its culture, the government created culture of Nazism to exterminate Jews, to exterminate other people that were in the camps, you know, it included communists, it included, um, I think, gypsies, gay people. Uh, there were, um, I believe, uh, certain sects of Christianity were sent to the camps 
uh, all political opponents who were sent to the camps. And it was, um, you know, that, that was the design and that's the way it was done. And the people that were left typically went along because they didn't really, that for them, everything was all fine and dandy. Um, but let's, let's skip all the history of what actually happened. Okay. We, I don't, you don't need me to tell you that this was an awful time in history, but Remember that Germany was defeated and it did get its comeuppance in, in a n number of ways. First of all, it was completely destroyed um, by the Allied onslaught. First of all, there were there were fire bombings in cities like Dresden that virtually reduced it reduced that city to rubble. It's a it's a it's a civilian. Um, massacre that isn't really covered in the war because the Germans are seen as the villains because let's face it they did provoke uh, most of the aggression in the war the other country would be Japan but nobody really talks about the Japanese responsibility for the war nobody talks about Italy's responsibility for the war nobody talks about the fact that the Soviet Union was at one point cooperating with the Germans uh, until the Germans turned uh, basically stuck the knife in their back and uh, went after them. So um, what happened was that uh, Germany was defeated. It came back as West and East Germany. East Germany was a communist puppet. West Germany was a uh, Western democracy. And um, what happened was that in East Germany, the government basically disavowed any responsibility for the Holocaust because they themselves were communists who had fled the country because they were afraid of being executed themselves. Um, so they didn't really feel any responsibility or commitment to, to um, talking about it. The other part of Germany, West Germany, was racked by something called the, called the silence culture, where people didn't really talk about what happened during the war because they knew people that had done things that were fucked up during the war. Um, and or they they'd lost people in the war, so it was a touchy subject. It was it, it, there has never been a country that's that has uh, looked at a war it's lost as some sort of um, you know topic of light conversation. And it doesn't matter whether it's a G Germany or or um, Japan. These countries that um, you know they perpetrated horrific crimes during the war. People don't talk about the Japanese war crimes, by the way. They still don't. Japan, Japan still has a much more restrictive silence culture than Germany does. So does Austria, by the way. People don't remember that Austria and Germany were one country during the war. Yet Austria doesn't really have the same amount of um, shame for the Holocaust as the Germans do. Um, so we have an issue where um, you, you, you really have people that went through an entire generation after the war, possibly longer, where German identity was kind of uh, harnessed be, because of a force that people did not want to acknowledge, the force of nationalism. And um, they were in sort of a limbo. They didn't know if they were they should be proud to be German or they didn't know if they should be ashamed to be German. And then eventually when there was a little more dialogue on this topic, um, we developed a guilt culture that's still been in Germany to this day. It includes what's been going on with immigration, this Angela Merkel nonsense where she's letting in millions and millions of people from the Middle East. Uh, they are definitely compensating, and they, they, there have been people that have said that they're compensating for their behavior during the Holocaust. Now, let me be clear. Um, I don't care if they want to make up for the Holocaust. The, 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 the way to do that is not by letting in a wave of people that are going to destroy your society from within, that, that, have, that are not willing to assimilate into that society, and to, to behave like you're some sort of... Um, like you're immune to that happening, I think is a recipe for disaster. I think a lot of people don't care if that's going to happen. They, they despise themselves as Germans to such a degree that they won't care if their own society is basically torn apart from within. And all I have to say is that that's a problem. Um, that, that's a problem no matter who you are. Unless you're somebody who deliberately hates the Germans, um, You'd probably see something uh, fucked up about that. 
I, I met, uh, I've had a number of German people I met. One of them was this coworker I had in my last job and we were eating lunch one day, me and him and a group of people. And he said that this was a problem that he, um, his people were caught up in this whole notion that they're guilty of the Holocaust, that Germans today are still guilty of the Holocaust. And to me, that, that's, that's really a, an awful way to live. You, you can't go and carry the burden of uh, a couple of generations back that you, you may have never known and that certainly you're not responsible for their actions. To me, I, I don't know if I could really relate to that. I think there's the same thing in the United States. There's this uh, um, white guilt. There's this self-hatred. It's not leading anywhere. And in fact, it's leaving people less functional and they want to be victims in order to be, first of all, in order to empathize with other people, but because it's fun to empathize with them. They're not really um, being the enlightened people that they claim to be. They're actually just posers and they're, um, they, can never, they can never actually accomplish this um, bizarre goal of theirs and it, it's the same thing in Germany and I think it's a shame um, the second topic I want to address is that the Germans went through this huge period where um, they or, or actually the Germans during the war let me rephrase this the Germans during the war they were not the only country to perpetrate the Holocaust but they were the chief country but there were countries uh, if you're not aware that would, um, or, or they were parts of other countries that the Germans, uh, for lack of a better term, liberated. And the, the people there, they decided, you know, this is great. And, you know, we're just going to perpetrate our own massacres of the Jews. And, you know, the, the fact that the Germans encouraged this was, was really only, it was, it was not even icing on the cake. It was like, a, it was like a, a basically a, a pretext. It was an excuse, and they they would they might have well done it had the Germans not ordered it if if they would have been um, so disposed. And the countries I'm talking about specifically, you you have for example Lithuania, Croatia, and Hungary. Uh, not so much France. Though those were known as collaborative nations. There were, there were a lot of nations that co collaborated with the Germans. There were only a few that really did take. Uh, very, let's say, proactive stance towards these policies. And, you know, Croatia, Hungary, and Lithuania, they, they all had these checkered pasts where sometimes you want to say, maybe this is understandable. Sometimes you say this is really, you know, obviously we're talking about a war crime, so it is beyond real, um, the real justification. But Lithuania had been occupied by the Soviet Union and it had always been uh, to one degree or another anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish, if you want to call it that, um, as I do. And when the Soviets occupied them, a lot of the Jews among them, the secularized Jews especially, took more of a liking to the Soviet regime. And therefore, the Jews were looked at as, as, as collaborators in many respects, even if they weren't really collaborating. And then the natural anti-Jew um, beliefs of these people did come completely to the surface. This was not, I mean, they now had, they now could call it a provocation that the Jews had participated in the Soviet conquest of Lithuania. And it was a similar issue in Croatia, which had been, it had been part of the kingdom of Yugoslavia. Uh, they decided that the Jews were the, were enemies of theirs, just like the Serbs. Okay, the, the, those were two enemies of theirs. They needed to get rid of them, and they did. They they got rid of I think about ninety five thousand Jews and and eight hundred thousand Serbs. Um, and the the third country I have in mind, Hungary, was just plain they, they didn't like the Jews. So, you know, they all went through these phases where they actively collaborated with the Germans and and helped them. Uh, murder people, uh, with the Jews being like the primary example, but there's others. Uh, like I said, the Serbs were murdered by the Croats, and, and um, there were, uh, likewise, after the war, there was a retaliation against all these people. There was a retaliation against the Croats and against the Lithuanians 
uh, under the Soviets and whatever. And, and it's, it's, it's really, you know, some people would call it, you know, karmic justice or something. I don't know if, if you can call it that, but you, you have to accept that after the war that, or, 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 you know, during the end, the, the end parts of the war, when the Soviets and, and their allies rolled through Eastern Europe, um, th these regimes, these anti-Jewish regimes, or, or these these uh, fascistic regimes, would because they were fascistic in their outlook, did receive a a um, consequence for what, whatever they did. It's it's indisputable. So I think um, you know we're not talking about an eye for an eye here, but this is a fact that's been buried by history that there were people that collaborated with the Germans or or even proactively went beyond the call of duty that the Germans called for. And all they would do after the war, it, first of all, because they were occupied by the Soviet Union, the United States had no interest in, um, you know, blaming them for what happened in the war because they needed these countries to to uh leave the soviet sphere they wanted to um draw the exiles the people that fled soviet domination and um, among them were a lot of nazis or a lot of uh nazi collaborators and, and the the united states had a, a vested interest in not um pr prolonging this issue so the people that were portrayed as the real culprits of the holocaust <clears throat> were in fact the masterminds and just if lively so they were the germans and so we see these movies then glorious bastards is the one that i write most about where the germans are, are like this um they're this cartoon villain they're um pretty much they're the opposite of everything we want to be they're they're um formal they don't want to be they're they're very systematic that they're, they're almost inhuman and machine-like and that's the way we view the Germans in, in, in American culture. And it's it's kind of gone overboard. Um, not that not that I care. I mean, I like watching those films. I don't, uh, you know, if, if there's a film that I dislike because it's about, you know, people from my sector, you know, my, my basic, re my basic um, reaction is to say wh whether it's a good film or not. And then if I don't like the content, <coughs> you kind of have to critique it. For a German watching these films, I think it, it must be kind of um, frustrating because it's just movie after movie after movie that does this. It's it's not it's not really changed at all, and it's and and it, for the past 72 years, it stayed the same. We haven't done as much regarding our other enemies, our other American enemies. You know, the Vietnamese, not as much. We don't really talk about North Vietnam uh, in the same vein as Nazi Germany, as far as an enemy. Possibly because of the Holocaust, okay? Now, this over-focus, I think it's because I did do a lot of reading in the past, and I, I know about this. And then I met people from, you know, the Croatian and Lithuanian community here. I think, um, <coughs> you know, at first, I did feel a little awkward, you know, meeting some of these people. It was, it was um, you know, it was, it was sort of like, I'm, I don't want to bring this up at all. And then later... You know, based on them knowing who I was and based on, on um, being able to, to, you know, just tactfully react to whatever questions I was getting, um, I think that I, I was able to realize that you have to let people live in the times that they're born in. And the Croatians that I meet, you know, they're a very uh, spirited group. They, they're, they're into their soccer and whatever, very close-knit community here. In Ohio, um, and you know, I, I actually talk talk about them a lot with people I know from from the county they live in. They live in Lake County, um, and uh, I have to say I, I can't really complain about any treatment I've heard from them. Now, it could be that there's still attitudes within that community left over from World War II where they hate the Jews. The only thing I can do about that is work. On um, you know my presentation, my, my uh, basically the way that <coughs> I appear to them, and you know be an example of a, a positive person within my community. Okay, so that that's the attitude I take. I also had a supervisor that was um, he, he was partial Lithuanian and just three, 
a uh, great person. Used to, he actually was kind of interested in the Holocaust. I don't know that he was aware of the role of uh, a sector of the Lithuanian population that was active in the Holocaust. But, you know, hey, on the other side of his family, he had an American GI that fought during the war. So what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to resent him for half of his family that may have possibly had ties to people. And I, and in fact, um, you know, he's, he's basically said that essentially they were not, but conceivably they could have been connected to people that perpetrated these crimes. Am I supposed to hate that half of him and then be friends with the other half? I don't think it really works that way. You really have to, like I said, allow people to live within the times that they were born in. And then another issue, and I'm going to, you know, I have a, Obviously, I'm not going to read this verbatim, but um, another issue is that there's this refrain that keeps getting used in reference to the Holocaust. It's called Never Again, and Never Again has, you know, traditionally meant that Western society should never let a genocide like what happened in the Holocaust ever be perpetrated against innocent people without... Uh, swift reaction and prevention by the international community. Now, in my opinion, <clears throat> that's been the biggest lie of the past 72 years. There have been so many instances of nations that, you know, whether they're full-blown genocides or just complete oppression, that um, they just uh, sweep under the rug and it's not that big of a deal. There's Tibet. Uh, I don't know if the scale is, is nearly as large, but Tibet, Tibet was, has been basically decimated as a nation by the Chinese occupation. People use the word genocide to what's happening in Israel. If you look at the definition, it's not a genocide at all. But people like to compare that, people like to frame that in the in the vein of the Holocaust because it's like you're, you're throwing it back at the Jews that they're doing the same thing as the Germans or something. If you really look at the numbers, at the facts, at the growth of population, it's not the same thing. It's a totally different situation you could you could talk about Palestinian grievances against the Jews in Israel, but it, it, to compare it to a genocide or the Holocaust um, is is really relying more on images and and public perception and not on uh, real facts <coughs> and figures. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, working on a little cough here. Um, but there have been dozens of genocides since the Holocaust, and there have been other other crimes. You know, maybe they're not ending with murder, but in, in Uganda, for example, they expelled their entire Indian population. Um, you, you have in uh, the Congo, there have been genocides every so often. It's, it's been almost like a, like a regular occurrence there. Uh, Rwanda, most famous example, and I, I brought it up, Samantha Power, the, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. under Obama, she made her mark in the world of journalism by documenting the failed U.S. response under President Clinton uh, to the massacre in Rwanda, the Rwandan genocide by the Hutu um, in Turahamwe against the Tutsis. So, essentially, what she did was she laid the she she um, relentless, relentlessly condemned the impotent response of Madeleine Albright and her symbolic gestures that did nothing to prevent the genocide and she she acted actually used in a, in a film i'll put the link she actually used the holocaust as a reference for why this is um basically her betraying america's mission in the world and then as she became ambassador to the u.n basically being the successor to madeline albright she became the u.n ambassador the u.s ambassador to the u.n in 2013 um she basically did the same thing with the Syrian genocide. This, this, Whatever is happening there with Assad and other people are committing genocides there too that are not connected to Assad. We can, we can be fair to both sides and call them both genocidal. Um, what she really did was a disgrace. And it, <clears throat> it just shows that when the shoe's on the other foot, it's not that easy to walk. Um, so we're, we're not talking about me, you know, cheering on whatever is going on in the world. We're ju I'm just acknowledging, and you should probably acknowledge too, if you're, if you're watching at home and trying to comment on 
um, you know, topics like the Holocaust. We have to acknowledge that we have never really addressed the issue of, of what's going to be happening. Uh, how, how do we pick which genocide to intervene in? There's so many going on. There was Darfur. There was Iraq. People claimed that, that Saddam was committing Holocaust and, and, you know, he was massacring uh, Kurds, but so are the Turks, and we never intervened against the, the Turks. So we, we don't know what to do. And this um, international liberalism, which believed that international organizations would solve this, has turned out to be just, uh, uh, it's, it's been the opposite. These things are actually often getting swept under the rug because international organizations have virtually no willingness to confront them. That's what happened in Rwanda. That's what happened in um, a number of these countries where this happens. Uh, I, I certainly don't see the UN ever doing anything about um, you know, a massacre happening in China. In fact, China murdered the most people in human history during the Mao regime, and the UN never lifted a finger. They did absolutely nothing. They didn't do anything in Cambodia either. And this murder on an on a unprecedented scale by communists during the 20th century is in my opinion the worst um, a lie of history, and you know it's it's really a shame that our nation can't you know address that too. You know we address the Nazis very well. We in fact maybe a little too well. We 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 go a little too in depth on what happened during World War II. We we have to acknowledge that World War II was not the bookend that that said genocide would never happen again. In fact. It might have opened up more and more room for it to happen even more than before. So that, that's that's all I'm going to say about other genocides. But there's <coughs> there's another issue, two more issues I'm going to address, and then we're going to wrap up for this test video. And uh, later I'll try to post it if it if it comes out right. I'll post it to um, Bold Like a Leopard. Uh, the YouTube and the Facebook, and um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, this Holocaust identity among the Jewish community. Look, I find it very, um, you know, it's 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 at least something that people identify with as Jews. But if it's the only thing you're identifying with as a Jew, then that's not really helping anybody. Um, and, and, and even if you take it as a personal, um, quest, uh, you, you might want to at least explore something else because I think the best example was, um, ex presidential candidate and, and current Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont, uh, a guy that I, I absolutely, I can't tell you how much I'm tired of him, but Last year, he, he made a statement that he was the child of Holocaust survivors, and um, that was his identity, and he saw people with arm, with uh, numbers on their arms. And, and this, was, this was something, you know, may, maybe a lot of people were saying, you, you know, this is great because uh, finally there's going to be a Jewish person, you know, running for higher office, running for the White House. And I said, you know what, I can do without this because um, you have, I've never heard to this day, Bernie Sanders have any other um, statement released or make a statement in public or, or, or say anything else about his Jewish um, background. Aside from this, everything is connected to the Holocaust. It's always that one thing. He's a one-trick pony on this matter. And um, <coughs> like I said um, in this article, uh, he was trying to make it seem, you know, yeah, I had people in my family that died during the Holocaust. Don't, don't fucking question my Jewishness. And what I wanted to say was, if that's the only way that you want to express your attachment to this community or religion, and I view it more as a religion than a community, but, you know, other people have their own perspectives, then, Frankly, I'm not impressed, and there, there's really no reason to support you. That it's the same as uh, this Bobby Jindal guy, um, who was an Indian. He was the governor of Louisiana. He barely identified as an Indian. In fact, he preferred to identify more as an American. Now, that's his choice. I'm not going to tell him, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to walk into his kitchen and tell him how to cut cucumbers. But um, 
if he wants to use that as a way to frame his Jewish identity, I think I, I will take a pass any day. And um, I, I, I wanted to ask people, you know, if you're watching out there, I don't care what religion you are. I don't care what country you're from. Let's say you're from Malaysia or whatever. Let's say you're from Malaysia. Do you frame your entire identity on the Malayan emergency of the 50s, you know, when the British were defeating Malayan rebels? No. I, I, probably not. I'm assuming you don't. Um, if you're from a country like uh, Cuba, do you frame your entire identity based on the Spanish-American War or on the Spanish occupation? Uh, it, it turns out that, um, you know, these countries that do, the, the countries that do frame their entire history on past um, in the nations, you know, like North Korea does, they have these uh, monuments against the United States. They, they usually don't su succeed very much because they need, they, ha they need that focus all the time on the country that wronged them. And that is something that I believe it's never going to be a um, real prospect for success for any of these countries. And, and that's, that's the way, that's the way I see it. You can see it differently. I think that the people that are Jewish that, that do this, they do they, they do a huge disservice to them. I, I said in this article, Irish people in America, they don't define themselves by the potato famine. People do talk about it once in a while, but they don't define themselves by the potato famine. The, the Chinese community here does not define themselves by the rape of Nanking or any of the other crimes perpetrated by the Chinese uh, communist regime or by the Japanese during World War II. They, they, they just don't. They focus more on being um, consistent with traditional Chinese values, which, uh, you know, I, I can personally respect. I've always, like, thought um, the, the Asian uh, nations that do have ties with tradition and whatever, I think that's what keeps them strong as countries and makes them as competitive as they are with the United States and the West. Much more competitive than Europe is, I can tell you that. But you can see from the example of communities here in the US. I'm, I'm talking about the black community. I'm not going to I'm not going to lie. You have black leaders like Sharpton, like Tariq Nasheed now that they feed off of the indignation of the past um, 400 years of, of uh, African um, African presence in the in the Americas and they they use that. They use that basically to put themselves on a pedestal above their own community and not improve their lives so that those people, they're using their um, their dissatisfaction with the past, they're not just their dissatisfaction, their anger, their resentment. They're, they're using the resentment of those communities in order to keep them down and keep them on top of that community as sort of uh, a chief, as a... Um, basically uh, a nobleman above them as a, as a Scottish lord, you know, an absentee lord. That, that's the way it is. Why do I use Scottish lord? Because in, in I think, the 19th and, and 18th and 19th centuries, a lot of the Scottish nobles spent more time in London than they did in Scotland because there wasn't much going on in Scotland. Um, and I call that the milk truck. You know, these people that they, they want to, perpetuate this indignation they want to perpetuate the anger and the and the the black communities um <coughs> struggle especially they want to keep it that way they're never going they're never as long as they keep it that way their job never ends they they stay on top they stay important i don't think it's just a matter of greed i think it's a matter of them needing to feel important and that's the only way they can and, and it's not gonna it, it hasn't worked for them and I don't think it's going to work for the Jewish community if, if we keep the same approach, even though we've succeeded in other things um, a lot, as you probably know. But that's a different matter for a different day. And what I am saying is that there are groups in the Jewish community that do this. They, they, do, they are um, Holocaust opportunists, for lack of a better word. There are That's a loaded term. I'm, I'm acknowledging it. But... They're using the Holocaust, like I said at the beginning, to push an agenda that has very little to do with helping that this community, with helping our, um, you know, our children get a better 
uh, background and understanding of, of where we come from. They, 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 it just has nothing to do with it. And um, we need to move away from it. And, and the, the, the two organizations I'm calling out today are the Anne Frank Center, which is this bogus organization. Uh, maybe at one point they did have a real um, value, you know, but they were never that large. And since last year being taken over by this, um, I think his name is Stephen Greenberg, uh, who's, a, who's actually more of a gay activist than a Holocaust activist. They've taken their organization from being a Holocaust education organization into being more of a liberal uh, agenda um, pushing group, like a, a li liberal pressure group. And this, especially against President Trump, uh, there's been a lot of rhetoric against President Trump. The same thing with Jonathan Greenblatt, uh, the, the current head of the Anti-Defamation League who basically took this organization, it was once an organization that, that you know, Jewish communities used to <coughs> stay aware of real threats to their community, and he, he basically um, propelled it into being a mouthpiece of the Obama agenda, and it's, it's wrong. I actually called for last, um, a few months ago, that Jews need to stop being um, supportive of organizations. They, they need to really start just expressing their views as individuals instead of letting these organizations, whether they're Republican or Democrat, by the way, I don't like the Republican Party either, and the Republican Jewish Coalition and, and APAC and whatever, they don't represent my views, but I represent my views. I'm not letting some person in, in um, Washington, D.C. Or in, or in L.A., in the case of the ADL, represent who what I think. I've never been to, to L.A., by the way. I've been to Washington, and the place is a fucking hole. And... I am going to fight, and, and if, if you're listening out there, anybody, it doesn't matter if you're Jewish, don't let an organization represent who you are if, if you don't think the way they do, okay? D doesn't matter what community you're in. That, that's really the message that I think is the takeaway from this piece. You know, aside from the fact, you know, I want to, I you know, move away from the German guilt. I want to move away from uh, just... Uh, blaming people that that weren't there for things that they didn't do. I want to tell people, you know, you have to think for yourselves uh, as opposed to taking your cues from people that you've never met. And if you did meet, they might even be using you. So, um, like I said, the Anne Frank Center, I actually got into a into a spat with them earlier this year, or at least some of their supporters. And I said to them, you know, th this organization is a fraud. You cannot go and use a past tragedy and basically turn it into some sort of uh, mallet that you used to bop people over the head, especially politicians and their supporters and whatever. That, that will only lead, believe me, when I say that will lead to more intolerance, it will lead, lead to more people hating us, being anti-Jewish or being anti, um, <coughs> you know, anti-minority, whatever you want to call it. I think it's a, it's a failed approach. Um, and I say that I say so I say that I say to all of you, Jews, other people, this is a fraud. Yes, there is anti-Jewish sentiment in the United States. And therefore, what? When our heritage becomes political fodder for politicians, we render ourselves back to the victim crowd. We lose our individuality and let polished elites do the talking for us. And I brought up this example. In the book of Exodus, there's these two characters. Uh, in English, it'd be called Dathan and Abiram, Abiram, I guess. And they were always inciting against Moses and Aaron. And they were saying, you know, why did they he take us out of Egypt? You know, we had everything in Egypt. We had fish. We had um, we had we had uh, I think they said birds to eat and whatever. They they were always belly aching over it, and they didn't care about the big picture. The big picture, the big big picture is this. You know, you have to find your own redemption. Um, in the case of the Germans, if we stop and um, and dwell on what they did to us back in the 40s then it's it's a double it's a double-edged sword okay yes we do keep this we do keep them on on their minds what they did to us but in reality we're just 
letting that identify who we are to the world. It, it's letting us be uh, looked at by the world as this victim nation. And then on their end, and then on their end, um, we're ba basically saying that a country that reformed itself to the degree that they did, to the degree that they did um, since World War II, and they've come a long way. Um, you can probably see it in products that you buy, but I'm not going to plug them. Um, <coughs> that, and, and basically in, in the, the difference of attitude that they have, if you meet German people, they don't behave the way you see in, um, in Glorious Bastards. Some people might think they do because what are you going to do? It's an accent. But um, in reality, we're saying by um, adopting this type of attitude that we don't believe in forgiveness and we don't believe in redemption. They can try as hard as they want and we're not going to forgive them. That's basically what you're saying. And you're not even talking about the people that perpetrated the Holocaust. You're talking about a generation or two later. Is that really the type of attitude that you think should represent us? Um, I, I don't. Okay, so that's up to you. Um, and I think that for us, it's better for the Jews that live in the modern times to, you know, yes, commemorate the Holocaust. But um, apart from that, you, you really have to start getting in touch with other aspects of who you are, of, of what being a Jew is, you know, watching, you know, whether that is part of the religion. OK, you should you should. I do think that even if you're not a believer you should at least learn about the religion. Learn about what you don't believe in. If, if you don't know what you don't believe in, then how, how do you know you won't like it? Okay? That, that's the approach you should take to, to, to other religions too, I think. But, but especially your own religion. Especially, you should probably start with your own religion. Why, why not? Um, and then, <laughs> you know, you, you can always find topics that will... You know, we have 5,000 of years, years of history. Why narrow it down to 12? Why narrow it down to 12? You can find a topic that will empower you or find a topic that will inspire you and not focus on one where we're basically dehumanized and turned into some sort of uh, enemy of the people as we were during World War II. And, um, you know, that's the basic message. And I think if we do that, you know, you can you can either trust me on this or not. We will be able to establish a better relationship with our families, with our friends, and with the people that, you know, they're looking at the Jewish community from the outside, the, 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 the neighbors, basically. We can, we can be the light among the nations that our scriptures tell us that we are, and this is the end. I hope you enjoyed this hour. I, I want to try to get up to YouTube. If it doesn't appear, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. But it was fun talking about it, uh, or not fun, but, you know, I think it was very reflective and therapeutic to talk about this, um, you know, problematic topic. And um, that's it for today. This is Ramon with Bold Like a Leopard, and we'll see you on the tube.